Hi, um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with the stream. Um, I'll be watching the chat in Hi. Twitch as well, um, so if anybody so has I'm any gonna questions go ahead, along the way, I'm going to get started with the stream. Um, and I'll, uh, take a I'll look. be watching the chat in Twitch um, as well, so if anybody so let's has go ahead any and get questions started. along the way, please feel free to post a message and I'll uh, take a look. Um, so the title of this presentation um, is Let's, so let's Make a Game Archaeology Edition. Um, so this is going to be a little um, bit so different. The title uh, of this presentation the is "Let's Make a Game: Streams and Panels Archaeology um, Edition from the Con um, Before." And so that, this um, is going to be a little bit different uh, from some of the streams and panels um, from the Con Before. In that um, I'm a game developer, so I'm coming from that side of things. So I'm going to be talking about how we, as game developers, um, are inspired by history and archaeology, and actually use that in creating games. Um, so here's a little rundown of what we're going to be talking about. Um, so do an introduction. Um, we'll talk about researching history from games with examples from specific games. Um, and then we're going to go behind the scenes of Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, um, which I worked on as an artist. So I'm going to be showing off one of the levels that I worked on for that and talking about how we um, looked at real historical locations when creating those places. Um, and then we're going to switch gears um, after that, and we're actually going to be doing some game development live on stream. Um, so I've been working on a tiny game um, that's based on the site of Scara Brea in Scotland. Um, so I've been making this game basically just for this presentation and for Archeo Gaming Con. Um, so I'm going to walk you through um, how I started making that and then also showing off some free tools that are available um, to anybody who wants to make their own games or interactives. Because um, there's a lot of cool stuff that's available out there, again, that's totally free to use that I think um, could be really interesting if archeologists or historians um, made use of for their own research. And then we'll do a final Q&A. Um, so just quickly, um, to give you an intro about me, uh, my name is Elise bromser Cloden. I've worked in the game industry for the past decade, since 2010. Um, worked on a lot of different types of games um, and mainly worked as an environment and level artist during that time. I'm currently an art lead at Robot Entertainment in Plano, Texas. Um, we're best known for the Orcs Must Die series, um, if you're familiar with that. So I'll talk a little bit um, about some of my past experiences here in a second. Um, and again, if you guys have any questions along the way, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, so let's go ahead and get started talking about research for games. Um, a lot of this is going to be coming from more of an art perspective because that's my specialty. Um, but this also just applies generally across game development. So as far as sources goes, this is kind of unsurprising probably, um, but here's a list of sources that developers might reference when they're working on a game. Um, first off is the internet, um, so you know this is what everybody starts with nowadays, um, so going and searching um, either by a specific place, a specific culture, um, or um, in my case as an artist what I might do is just go to Google Images or Pinterest and start looking through imagery to see what inspires me visually um, and kind of go from there. Um, obviously, there can be some downsides to this. Um, for example, I was just researching uh, the site of Puma Punku in Bolivia because um, you know, I'd known about it and I knew that it had some really cool um, architecture that I was interested in exploring more. And I think like 50% of the content that came up was ancient aliens garbage. So um, since you know most game developers are not trained archeologists or historians, it's possible <laughs> that there's some uh, really bad misinformation that um, you could find there if you don't do um, more thorough investigations. Um, so going to the next um, source here, we have books or libraries. Um, if you're really going to be investing in um, researching um, something historically based, this is a really good idea to do a little bit more in-depth research that's hopefully a little bit more um, vetted. So I actually have a couple examples here. Um, the studio that I work at currently, again, Robot Entertainment, 
was actually founded by uh, former former ensemble devs who worked on the Age of Empire series. So one cool thing uh, that we had in the studio uh, up until recently was um, the research library from Ensemble. So we actually had a ton of books um, that they had used when they were researching Age of Empires. So here's an example of one of them that I grabbed because we actually just cleaned out the library at the studio. Um, so we were able to take some of these home, but this is The Art of Mesoamerica from Olmec to Aztec, and this is by Mary Ellen Miller, who is um, a really well-regarded source. Um, so this was um, a library that the developers were referencing as they worked on this series, and a lot of these books had post-it notes and things stuck in them still from when they were working on it, so that was pretty cool, and obviously um, if you're looking at um, texts like that, that's going to have some really good information. Um, other than that, you could do a location visit to the actual site if you, you know, have the uh, budget for something like that. If it's a site that you could actually go visit, um, that would be a really great way to get more information. Um, or going to museums if there's, you know, an exhibit about um, what you're researching. Um, if you uh, really want, you know, that next level, you can always hire an expert historian or archaeology consultant. That's something that I know Ubisoft has done for the Assassin's Creed series. Um, I believe they actually have historians on staff working on that project. And obviously, as that series has grown, those games have gotten enormously complex, and they're always based in real-life locations and based on real-life cultures. So that's something that they obviously have invested um, into, is to actually get that right by talking to experts. Um, otherwise, as an artist, again, photographs are key. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but, you know, again, if you're looking for um, reference, Google Images or Google Maps or, um, you know, the Internet has a ton of stuff available. Um, again, probably with varying degrees of, uh, you know, information surrounding those. So be careful what you're looking at. Um, and also uh, historical illustrations could be extremely helpful because um, especially if you're going to be setting a game in the time uh, that this place was inhabited or active, you need to actually know what that looked like um, at the time. So that's pretty invaluable that you can find um, sources like that. Um, and then Finally, there's new sources that are available. Again, f on the art side, particularly uh, 3D scans and photogrammetry have been really cool to see that um, kind of rise through the past few years. And there's big, big games like um, uh, the Battlefront series um, that have utilized photogrammetry really heavily in their workflows, um, actually scanning in real life assets to put into the game to make them um, give them a photo real quality. And uh, that's something that the archaeological community has embraced as well. So again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit when we get to the game jam portion. Um, but you know, if you're working on um, a specific site that's actually based on um, something real life, if you could get access to a 3D scan of that as a 3D modeler, that's pretty invaluable. Um, so taking a look at some specific examples of the way that this uh, research could be applied to different games. There's obviously a million different ways you could um, utilize it, but um, on the art side, um, you know, you could think of art as a way to skin something. So in this Overwatch example, we have the Tempest of Anubo uh, Temple of Anubis level, and um, you know, this could technically look like anything probably, but they chose to set it um, in this uh, temple that's based on Egyptian architecture. And so um, it's, you know, pretty cool. And they've melded that with the newer technology here in the back as if it's been retrofitted on top of the pyramids. And, um, you know, obviously they would have been referencing um, Anubis statues and Egyptian architecture and um, everything like that to create this level. But again, it doesn't necessarily affect the game that much other than the visuals in this case. Um, and here we have a design example um, that's actually um, influencing the gameplay more so. So this is Uncharted 2. Um, I can't remember exactly what happens in this puzzle, <laughs> but I have a vague idea um, from playing it a long time ago where um, 
you know, these arms hold different objects and this is a puzzle that you actually have to solve to progress in the game. So this would be an example of a developer, you know, coming across a statue like this um, and then saying, okay, well, I could actually use that to create a puzzle from this if we, um, you know, utilize his many arms in this case, um, and then coming up with something really creative like that. So uh, now we're going to go uh, to a behind the scenes look at Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Um, so this is actually the first game that I worked on um, back in 2010. Um, and I started as a 3D modeler and then um, also did some work on the levels for them. Um, so I'm going to show you a video um, of the epilogue level. So spoilers, uh, this is the last level in the game if you haven't played it, um, <laughs> but it's been out for a long time, so I feel pretty comfortable doing that. Um, so this will just give you uh, a refresher or show you the level if you haven't seen it before. There's something up there. Uh, so, oh, we'll, we'll just stay down here then, shall we? This area here um, is all stuff that I modeled out. Um, so this organ area um, and the shrine below that. And so this is a really good example of what I was just talking about um, with the place influencing the design. Um, so you can see these uh, uh, ledges coming down from the ceiling here. Obviously that doesn't happen in real life. We did not build them to be wise. And now they are our final vaulted hope. You are they. for understanding, but you broke our tools or turned them against one another. We have destroyed what we could, sealed away what we cannot. Again, this is the developers coming up with something's something open. Kind of creative to create a game for Most, the past. Not all, and it does not take many to unwind the world. Here is a safe place, eternal. To store objects, words, wisdom, but not life. Almost did we have the means, but time, time erodes us. Right, we're not going to watch the whole thing here. It's going to take a while. Um, so this level is based on a basilica in Rome. Um, it exists. You can go visit it. Um, so uh, going back to the different uh, sources the developers have to work from, the main one for me working on this was photographs. Um, and this is, you know, in pristine condition today. So these are uh, modern day photos of the building you can see over here. Um, so if you were in Rome, you could actually go visit it. And I am not sure, but I imagine they would have had a team go out to take photos of this. Um, on location for us to reference. It's been quite a while though, so I can't, can't be sure. Um, but we had a lot of photographs to work from, so I imagine that was the case. Um, so again, these are some of the areas that I worked on. Um, so uh, I was a modeler uh, on this level, so I was working with a senior artist who was in charge of creating this, um, along with a level designer who was in charge of creating the gameplay path itself. Um, so I was given specific areas to focus in on and then um, create the 3D models of um, to place in the level. So I um, worked on these chandeliers here, which were based on these up here, um, created this little shrine, which um, is based on this shrine back here. And uh, the biggest piece in this level was this pipe organ back here, um, which you could just see in the video. You were kind of climbing up this way all over to get to the top of the ledge here. Um, so, again, it's been a while since I worked on this, but if I recall, um, there definitely were um, 
some areas where we kind of had to fill in the gaps because we were working from photographs and we weren't you know actually on location ourselves so um, I remember trying to kind of extrapolate some of the details on the organ back here based on what we had available um, this is another asset down here um, that I worked on um, and so as far as um, you know the full pipeline of making this level goes um, I, I was pretty low on the totem pole at the time uh, so I'm not sure like you know who would have made the call to pick this specific location for it um, but someone on the creative team you know would have decided on the locations that they're setting these different um, parts of the game in um, and so these levels that we were working on were all based on real places um, but we did take artistic liberties for the gameplay specifically so Again, a perfect example of that is this ceiling area um, in this uh, basilica. So you can imagine a game uh, designer getting in here and seeing this and thinking, okay, yeah, this would be a really cool idea for a puzzle. And um, since this is Assassin's Creed, you're going to be climbing and jumping. So um, somebody came up with the design for the puzzle um, where it, the parts of the ceiling are actually coming down and creating the gameplay path up in the ceiling area which is pretty cool um, and since this is a game particularly back in 2010 you know uh, we're always going to be limited by technical and art limitations um, so uh, game consoles and platforms have become a lot more powerful in the past 10 years but even today we still have um, you know pretty stringent guidelines that we have to work within um, things like uh, the number of polygons that we're putting into these assets. So we're not going to be able to model out every tiny nook and cranny in an asset like this. We have to be pretty careful with um, our budget for that. And also just the number of different textures and materials that are applied to all these different surfaces in the game level. We only have so many of those available. And um, part of that is because we have to um, watch for the draw calls and the texture memory in the game on the tech side of things but also because we only have so many artists working on this game and so while uh, you know a project like an assassin's creed game has literally thousands of people working on it um, across the world even then um, you only have so many resources there is a finite amount so we do have to be um, careful with reusing what we've created um, and uh, just being cognizant of the fact that everybody is under a deadline to ship this game. So uh, if anybody has any questions about the development side of things at this point, um, feel free to post those. Um, we're going to go ahead and switch gears to go to the game jam portion. Um, so uh, the working title of this little mini game I've been working on is called The Isle. Um, it's inspired by Neolithic Scottish history, and it's based on the site of Scarabrea in the Orkney Isles. Um, so, number one, why did I choose this site for this project? Um, well, I was looking around on Sketchfab um, to try and find a site that inspired me for this presentation to start this game for. And uh, one thing that I came across is actually several scans of this house from Scarabrea. Um, so this is, I believe it's house one at the site. Um, and there's, like I said, there's several different photogrammetry scans of this house, which is pretty cool. So you can actually see a huge level of detail um, in this scan. And then this also has um, these citations, which are calling out um, different areas, which is also extremely useful information. Um, and then the key with this one also was this is actually downloadable. So Sketchfab has a ton of cultural heritage and history um, scans um, or 3D models on its site. A lot of these are now actually downloadable like this for use under Creative Commons license. Um, so in this case, I was actually able to download the scan of the 3D model and uh, use that as a direct reference to make the in-game models, which I'll um, show you guys in a minute. Um, so that was a huge factor. That was a huge kind of jump start to this um, game jam process. So I was like, okay, sounds like a cool idea. 
Um, and then I started researching the site more. Um, and another thing that I came across also on Sketchfab, um, this is actually from the same archeologist who uploaded these, um, but these are carved stone balls um, that many are from Scarabrea, um, some are just from around Orkney. Um, but these are artifacts that they've found all over this area and they don't really know what their purpose was right now. Um, but you can see they're quite varied and um, they're just really interesting objects. Um, and looking at this through a game development lens, this seemed like the perfect thing you could go out and collect um, as a collection mechanic in the game. So um, put a pin in that idea and said, okay, I'm starting to kind of coalesce something in my mind here about how we could make a, a little game based on this location. Um, so the next thing I did, I just did more research on the site, um, went out to the library, got a book on prehistoric Scottish history, so read a little bit more about that, um, and uh, learned more about you know the people who lived here, um, what their day-to-day -day life was like, um, and started gathering that information to um, coalesce into the game idea. So once I had um, the basic idea down, and some research done in it, um, I put together this really um, short game design document for it, just so I kind of know what I'm going to be doing. Um, I'm not going to read through this whole thing, but I will make it available um, on my blog after this presentation. Um, so, you know, this is a game based on Scarabrea. Um, it's going to take place in a small village in Neolithic Scotland, um, and the story that I came up with it uh, came up for it with was uh, you play as this person who's become really bored with the routine of their life um, and they want to start a new adventure so they're going to get ready for that journey to leave their village for the first time. Um, so for the game mechanics themselves, um, the main one is going to be collection. So that again that goes back to uh, the inspiration that I got from the carved artifacts that they found at the site. Um, the first um, type of object you're going to collect is consumables, so seaweed, limpets, and seabird eggs was what I decided on. Um, the reason for this is these are um, things that would have been available at the time that they would have made use of, so seaweed um, they actually would have used as a fire fuel source um, because the site is right on the coast. It was a easy source of um, burnable material. Uh, limpets, uh, these are you know small little mollusk, kind of like a mussel or a, a clam. Um, and it sounded like they could have been eaten, um, but more likely they were most often used as fishing bait. They're pretty tiny, so that makes sense. Um, and then seabird eggs, they would have collected these to eat as a protein source. So these would all be things you could imagine somebody gathering um, to get ready for a journey. Um, so then if enough of these consumables are collected to complete the main quest, you finish your preparation and you're able to leave the village. Um, and then we have artifacts, so these are based on these artifacts um, that we just showed over here. Um, so these are non-functional items which the player has to explore around to collect, um, and you're not actually required to find all of them to complete the game, this is like a side quest item. Um, the main game loop is going to have a title screen, um, you'll start the game, and I'm going to run through all this actually in a second in-game itself. So on that note, uh, this is Unreal 4. Um, so this is a game engine um, that is pretty widely used in the game industry. Um, it's made by Epic Games, um, who made Unreal Tournament. Um, and Fortnite more recently. Um, this is actually what I use um, at work currently, and I've been using it in some form or another probably for about 15 years. Um, it's come a long way since then. So, um, as I said, I've been working on this um, game for a while before this presentation, just during this week, because there's no way we were going to you know, make a complete game in you know, less than an hour for the presentation, so I've done a lot of legwork already. Um, but we'll have a few different things to put in um, during the stream. So one thing that I already put in um, 
was a title screen. So this is pretty simple. Um, got the title and then you can actually start the game from here. And I'll just go ahead and show y'all what I have in here thus far. So you wake up, it's going to tell you um, kind of what's going on at the bottom here. line pops up telling you what you need to get um, and you can go around and start to gather what you need um, the counters do work sometimes but for some reason they seem kind of hit or miss so here we can see I found one of the carved stone balls and that actually pops up um, the side quest there. It's going to tell you you need to find three of those. So this is your little village. Um, you can kind of see how these uh, houses were constructed in that they're underground with the roofs that come out on top. would be where you can collect um, some of the other things you need. So we've got some seaweed here. And if I collect this, yeah. The counter actually works at the end for some reason. Um, but that's basically what I have so far. Um, so we're going to start adding to it. Um, and I have it broken up in two levels right now. So this is the title screen level. It's pretty simple, it just has um, a camera and then I'm overlaying a UI with the title on top of that. Um, and then this is the game level itself. So uh, I wanted to walk y'all through how I kind of came up with this layout for it um, and how I started going about making um, the house and the village itself. Um, so let me hide a few things here. Um, I decided to go with this really um, simplistic style for everything just because it's, you know, a super quick game project. So I didn't want to invest any time into creating really nice, you know, photo real looking assets or anything like that. Um, but what I did do is I imported that scan that I had found on Sketchfab. So again, this is downloadable. So I was able to actually bring this into the engine directly um, and then use it as a reference point to start off with. Um, so when I brought in the scan, um, it was not to any kind of scale. It was pretty ambiguous. You can see it's actually scaled to uh, about um, a quarter of its original size here. Um, so when I brought it in, uh, I really didn't have any idea of how big it should be. So one thing that I did um, is I started um, looking for reference um, as to how tall some of these objects um, should be in real life. So I went, I looked at Google Maps, and I also looked at some uh, historical illustrations, um, which I can show you all here, um, to try and work out like what scale this building actually should be. Um, so there's actually a recreation of this house um, that I believe is at the museum at Scarabray itself. So I was able to find some images of that. Um, also was able to see, you know, how the roof would have been constructed here. And then um, looked at some of these historical uh, illustrations to kind of get a sense of how big the space should be. So I can see, okay, here's a person in the back. His head is just a little bit taller than this stone shelf in the back, so you can kind of use that to um, get a sense of scale. Um, and what I did was actually throw in um, what's called the mannequin in Unreal 4. 
so um, that is um, so this is just a kind of a robot looking model that comes with um, Unreal 4 and he is right about six feet tall so I can use that um, as a skill reference here so I can see okay he's if I know he's about six feet tall I can see he's just a bit taller than that and I was able to scale this down to something that seemed um, appropriate now one caveat on that um, oftentimes with games you actually maybe need to make a space bigger than it would be in real life um, just because you know you have um, collision and cameras to deal with and things like that so um, sometimes you might have to make something larger or possibly smaller in some cases um, to kind of accommodate um, the gameplay needs so you might not be able to completely match the scale of a site even if you really want to <laughs> um, so I got that down and uh, one other asset that I um, got was this map of the site hide some of these rocks so this was a site plan um, that I got there were a lot of these just available online um, and so I was actually able to just put the image of it onto a plane in the engine and then um, use it as a guideline as to where um, some of these things should be based. So it um, looks like this actually got moved around a little bit. This should be maybe more like that, where house one would be. Um, but this is really helpful because I can get a sense of um, you know the size of the village overall and also like how these different underground houses were connected to each other um, via this main passageway here. Um, so I used that to um, filled out the initial map so since we're not going to be building the whole village um, I chose to have a house here I'm going to have another one over here and then I'll have this passageway that lines up um, with this section of it over here for our map so that's how I started um, and then um, I imported the 3D scan into my 3D modeling program and then I used that um, as a reference point to actually create um, the low poly geometry here that you're actually going to see when you play the game. Um, and then also referenced um, that image that I just showed um, from the recreation um, to build out this roof for it too. So when you actually play the game, you're not going to see that, that's actually going to be hidden. Um, one uh, thing that I did change for gameplay reasons um, is the door height. So you can see in the scan, these doors were very tiny. Um, you actually had to crawl through even back in the day. And um, from what I was reading, that was probably to do with um, temperature regulation. Um, smaller openings probably kept the inside warmer. Um, but because I'm making this game quickly and I do not have a crouch mechanic um, accessible from the template that I'm going off of, I just went ahead and made the door taller so you can actually walk through it. Um, otherwise, the player character was getting stuck on it. Um, that would probably be something I would want to fix if I made this game for real, though, because that seems like kind of a cool um, little feature to actually have to crouch to get out your front door that's specific to the site. Um, so, one other thing that uh, we need to do is we actually need to add the third type of consumable. So we have seaweed out here, we have these limpets, we have the spheres, which are that side quest. Um, but we need to make a seabird egg, so um, I was going to walk through the process of making a model for that and then bringing it in and making a collectible object. Um, I'm going to be using Blender, which is a free 3D modeling program. Um, Blender 2.8, I think it is, just came out recently and it's been getting uh, a lot of buzz um, because it's extremely full featured and again it's completely free um, and it does all kinds of things. Um, you can see up here, you know, it has modeling, has sculpting, um, like a, a program like ZBrush. Um, 
It's got animation tools. It even has, I believe it still has its own game engine um, in here as well, which I haven't used. Um, but today we're just going to be doing some modeling in it. Um, disclaimer, it's been several months since I've actually modeled something in Blender. Um, so it's going <laughs> to be a little bit slower than it normally would be. Um, and I swear I can model. It's just, again, I haven't really used Blender in a while. Um, so we're going to be making something super easy. Luckily, though, we're just going to be making um, that seabird egg. All right, so that's the way it starts out. So we're going to make a new object here. We'll make a mesh, and we'll start with a sphere. All right, so I'm switching into uh, edit mode up here, and I'm going to turn on um, x-ray mode, so I'm going to be able to see all the faces that I'm selecting. And I'm just going to start uh, oh no, modeling out. And again, please bear with me while I try and remember all the hotkeys here. So we're going to pull that up. Scale that. Oh, great. So I've somehow switched it into paint instead of select. Pretty derpy looking egg. Try and smooth that out some. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't select it. Drag. So much more painful than it should be. Oh my god. Alright, you know what? I'm just gonna call it. Um, let's pretend like that was smoothed out. Actually, let's, let's save this and see if we can restart. So we'll smooth out these faces. And again, still kind of a wonky egg, but we're going to go with it. So let's export this. Um, I don't have my units set up in here, so I'm actually not sure what the scale is right now, but we can scale it in engine. So we'll export that as an FBX file, and then we'll go into our content browser over here and import that model. Here it is. Um, gonna go ahead and make a new texture or material rather for it. And let's give it kind of a, a bluish color. Something bright though so you can see it. So I've made um, just a basic flat color material like this ahead of time that I'm just using to um, 
make new instances of that I can change the color on very quickly. So obviously this is a very, very big egg. <laughs> Let's see if we can scale it to more appropriate size. Instead of just doing that, let's do this. We'll fix the import scale itself so we don't have to do it once. Okay. Okay, so now our egg is sized properly, looking pretty egg like good and now we need to make a new collectible version of it so right now this is just a static mesh if you walk up to it you can't really do anything with it it's just going to sit there um, so in Unreal 4 um, the visual scripting language is called blueprints and uh, you can pretty much do anything um, you could do with C++ via blueprints programmer would probably um, be mad at me for saying that. That's probably not completely true, but you can do a heck of a lot. Um, and as an artist, it's incredibly useful to be able to do um, things that, um, you know, back in the day we would have needed a programmer's help to do. So um, in this case, I have a blueprint already made for the seabird egg. Um, so this is inheriting um, the collectible object class. So this already has a bunch of um, scripts it's referencing to be able to be collected. So this is going to be pretty simple. Um, you can see I have this um, sphere in here as a placeholder. So that's what it looks like right now. So really all I have to do um, is replace the sphere in this case because I already had it set up. So place it there and then I believe static mesh variable here. Um, so I'm using um, a template for a first person story adventure game that I was able to purchase um, on the Unreal Marketplace. So it came with a lot of stuff pre-set up. So like the um, collectible blueprint, for example, um, and you can um, inspect these objects and everything. Um, like. So, so that was already set up for me, and then I'm able to go in and edit it so I'm not having to um, make my own game from scratch. And that's another really nice feature of Unreal is that it has a lot of um, assets available right now. And the same with Unity as well. Um, Unity has a huge marketplace of um, assets and gameplay things, uh, scripts and such that you could go purchase or download for free in some cases. So the egg is very tiny in this blueprint, so we may have actually scaled the mesh a bit too far. So let's scale that back up to one. There we go. Um, okay, so anyway, you can see we have this egg and <laughs> It's a bit lopsided. I wonder if that's the location of it in the blueprint. Yeah, so if we move this up, I think that would probably fix it. Maybe. No. Mm. Well, that's okay. We'll just have a lopsided collectible egg for now. And actually, one thing that I forgot for this egg um, was I was putting um, this pulsing material on the collectible objects so you can see that um, they're actually a bit different from um, anything else in the scene. So I'm going to swap out this uh, master material for the egg for this collectible one, and that's going to have that pulsing built in. quite hard to see, so let's actually change the color of this egg to There we go. 
Okay, so uh, one other thing we need to do to finalize this object is we need to actually make it collectible. Um, disclaimer, I'm doing everything real quick and dirty in here, so if any programmers are watching, I am sorry. I'm just doing the best I can to make this game <laughs> functional right now. They are not being collected. Um, I'll have to fix that later. I'm not sure what's going on then. Um, so the last thing we're going to do on the stream is actually place these objects around the level. Um, so right now I just have everything kind of laid out on the beach, but that's not really super fun. So let's actually place these um, as they would be placed in the actual game. So laying them out for you to collect them and explore. So we have some seaweed here that obviously needs to go on the beach. So we'll put one over there, put one kind of in the middle, a little bit further back. So uh, if you remember, we actually have one of these limpets inside the house itself, which was actually based on um, something I was reading about, that they had these little tanks, possibly, inside the house that they may have used to store little sea critters and things, um, that they would have had water in as well. So I thought that would be kind of cute to have one of those in there and also make it a little bit more challenging maybe for the player to find all of them if they've missed that one in the beginning. seabird eggs. So one thing I had done ahead of time too is I made these little nest models because it seemed like we needed um, something you know, to ground those in the scene. So we can put one egg here. We we'll actually put two So we'll have one over there and maybe we'll actually put one up here. Okay. So now we have all our consumables placed. And now we're gonna finish placing these artifacts. find some hidey holes for these. Um, we have one in the other house, if you remember. So maybe we'll put one back here. Okay. And then we'll put the last one somewhere out in the All 
right, so that's all set up. Um, so let's play the game again, um, and then I'll kind of walk you through what it ultimately would do. So we'll go back to the title screen. a finite distance that you're actually able to interact with these objects with, um, so clearly a couple of these are actually too far away, probably too low on the terrain right now. This is why playtesting is super important. Um, so imagine that we've got all our resources collected, so eventually what it would tell you to do is go back home, so you'd go back to your house, um, and then you'd have a bag that you need to pack to get ready for your journey, so you put everything in there, and then it would instruct you to leave the village, so you'd go back out, back up here and then you'd go over here which is the exit point for the village and then as you get here it would ask you if you're sure you want to leave and then um, you can actually leave and for the purposes of this game that would end the game um, but you can imagine you know if this is a full game um, this could just be a starting quest um, and then you'd actually have um, a lot more game outside of the walls of the village itself. So uh, that is our stream for the day. Um, if anybody has any final questions, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, I'd love to talk more about it with you.
Um, and uh, here's my info. Um, I'm at Elise BK on Twitter. Um, that's my Discord handle. And my blog is realtimeheritage.com. Um, thank you to Archie Fantasies and Archie RPG for hosting this con. It's been a lot of fun so far, and I'm excited for next year already because I think this could be something really cool to keep continuing. Um, so please reach out and uh, have a great day, everyone.